Now, I do want to get to another country, Cambodia. And the leader, Pol Pot. Now, I told you at the beginning of the semester when we talked about the Enlightenment, brother, that I'd be mentioning Pol Pot later. Well, here it is, folk. Essentially, Pol Pot was a Cambodian young man who went to France to study the Enlightenment. And he had some professors there who convinced him that the big problem with human beings was civilization. That man was really an animal and he needed to return to his animal nature and that any trapping of civilization was detrimental. Therefore, it was up to each of us to try to return man to his basic animal instincts. So Pol Pot went home and began to convert his people to what he thought was an enlightened state, namely to revert them to the primitive animal that he said that they were. Anyone who wore glasses could be executed. Anyone who was educated would be executed. Anyone who dressed nicely or was rich could be executed. Basically, he went, uh, the, the people who were educated began to dress in rags and pretend that they weren't. The persons who were rich began to pretend that they were poor, or if anything, to try to flee the country. The fact is, folk, he killed one-seventh of his population, or over a million people. Now, this will sound gory, but it's a, there's a picture on page 909 in your book that shows a bunch of bones that were later dug up about the Holocaust, Cambodian Holocaust. Now. It's interesting enough that we had a discussion this Tuesday, or that a few of you, and I don't know if this is a group, the opinion of the majority of you, a few of you said that any government should be able to do anything it wants to with its own citizens with no outsider interfering. Well, I'm going to tell you in a minute which outsider did interfere. Nobody in Cambodia would stand up to Pol Pot. Some people escaped and went to the United Nations and stood up in the United and told the UN what was going on so the whole world knew that Pol Pot was killing his people by the tens of thousands. And the United States at this time was suffering what was called the Vietnam Syndrome. We're not going to get involved in another Southeast Asia war, so the United States stayed away. The UN stayed away. Of all people who finally rose up and overthrew Pol Pot, it was Vietnam. Even they couldn't stand Pol Pot. They moved in, overthrew Pol Pot. Pol Pot then went deep into the jungle and fled there, where eventually it's known he died of old age, I guess. You might call it old age. He died there in the jungles in hiding, but nevertheless, we believe he's gone. And some kind of law and order then was restored to Cambodia. Now, the question that somebody rose last time about Iraq. Was Iraq better off after Saddam Hussein left? No, but in this case, was Cambodia better after Pol Pot left? Definitely yes. Um, all right, anybody have any comments? Oh, I just want to know why did they dig all this stuff in the museum? Um, I can't tell you why. I mean, hey, the Jews have a museum, several museums, dedicated to the whole, one in Washington, D.C., and one right here in Atlanta, Georgia. I have been to it, dedicated to the whole, and I went to Israel once. They have a huge museum dedicated, dedicated to the Holocaust in Israel, and they have some in Germany. And a lot of it is, we don't want to forget these people who were killed. You know, they were human like the rest of them. They have to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. But they were human. We don't want to forget. Um, and another is, I think, to remind the world that, hey, if you do as Pol Pot did, you can expect to have a downfall like Pol Pot did. A warning to the rest of us. Um, again, I don't know what the reasoning was, but uh, as gory as this museum looks, I can understand why they, I think I can understand why they would do it. To give some kind of closure. In other words, let's remember these people and not remember what happened to us and let's not forget this awful chapter in our history. Um, anyone else? You said the guy's name that was from Singapore was John Lin? Who? The Lin guy? Oh, Lou Yan. 
Yeah, I didn't write his name down. Lu Yan. Um, yeah, uh, I didn't write his name because I. Was, well, no, wait a minute. Uh, he might be on it. <laughs> Singapore, I'm not even sure that's the pronunciation. Um, well, I will get to him in a little bit, but of course I've already talked about it. All right. Um, these people have formed together and formed a union called ASEAN, which basically is a short for the an organization of Asian nations, and it's, they did it without the United States. At one time, the United States was involved in an organization called CETO. CETO fell apart, particularly the downfall of Vietnam. So these people got together to form their own cooperative to try to benefit each other economically. Now, in general, Southeast Asian people are hardworking, thrifty, and saving. They, um, and when they come to the United States, they'll sometimes get jobs at our factories and they have bunched together, sometimes 40 and 50 of them to a house and uh, crowd up. Now, I don't know if this is going on as much as it once did, but um, or they'll crowd up 10 and 20 to an apartment and sleep on the living room floor anywhere they can and uh, crowd together. But the whole idea is to save money. I worked with a Korean lady at Lockheed. Now Lockheed made a point to hire people from the country that we sold airplanes to, including Korea. And when we were, some of us were talking about strike, the company isn't treating us fairly, she'd say, you don't know how well off you have it. Well, hey, you don't know how great it is here. Um, she refused to participate in the strikes and got kind of ostracized somewhat with the rest of us. Um, again, she was paid the same thing we were because you know, doing the same kind of work, which for them was quite a bit of money. And it was, she, it was rumored that she was bunching up in a house with about 14 or 15 other Koreans who were all sharing the expenses of two or three cars and the rent expense and the utility expense, the phone expense, and saving a whole lot of money in the process. And again, uh, this is typical of the uh, way that the Koreans and a lot of other Southeast Asian people have done. All right. Um, a big problem, then I'll move on to Japan. Tradition. Every group of people in the world has this problem in that they once lived in isolated pockets of women. The, the, the history of mankind before 1500 was isolated pockets of humanity. Then the world became aware that the other pockets existed, and each pocket found customs that were offensive to other parts of the world. Uh, was, I mean, in some parts of the world where that women would, when their husband died, would throw themselves on a fire and burn themselves to death. Uh, these customs were found offensive to other parts of the world, etc. But particularly is the role of women. Uh, the modern political correct climate says that women should be treated as equals. And some places in the world have had a very difficult time with this, including Southeast Asians. Um, but more and more women are, be their, their women are becoming more and more like Western women. They're allowed to own property, allowed to get out and earn their own money, and allowed to inherit alongside the men, and allowed to divorce their husbands. And in some cases, They've actually served as heads of state. Some governments have allowed uh, women to serve as their dictator. But nevertheless, they're not truly equal in any country in Southeast Asia. Um, and it very seldom do they rise to positions of, at the top. OK, Japan, the Asian giant. When Japan was defeated in World War II, the emperor was told he could no longer call himself divine. And of all the World War II leaders, the emperor was the last one to die. He lived some 44 uh, years, and finally died, I believe, in 1989. He lived 44 years after the war ended. 
The United States occupied Japan and continues to do so to this day. Now, there have been some moves on by the Japanese to try to persuade the United States to leave, but the United States was determined that Japan was not going to rise up and, uh, and fight, us, fight America again. Now, Japan has a constitution that outlaws war. Supposedly, they'll never go to war again, but they do have a military. Every nation needs one. And in view of the unrest going on with China and with North Korea, a lot of Americans have said what we ought to do is uh, let Japan rearm, just like we rearm Germany, and we'll keep them on our side. Anyway, um, Japan, though, has not rearmed, but Japan has been felt threatened by war with China. The Chinese claim that certain islands are theirs, and the Japanese claim that they are theirs. And um, we don't know how this is going to turn out. One bad thing about the Japanese, and I had one of your students, I believe in the other class, maybe this one, do a paper on it. The Japanese have never apologized for their atrocities in World War II. The Japanese took a whole lot of Korean women and made them serve as prostitutes for, uh, for Japanese soldiers. They also tortured and killed a lot of Koreans and Chinese. And their history books, when they talk about World War II and history, they don't mention this at all. It's fact that they act like it never happened. They have never admitted that it happened, and they have never made any attempts to make amends. And until they admit it happened, they're not going to make amends. So uh, this is something that has really upset the, their Korean neighbors and their other Chinese neighbors also, that Japan has not done anything to atone for its misdeeds during the war. There is a lot of racial prejudice in that area, with the Japanese uh, looking down on the, the, particularly the Koreans and also the Chinese, and uh, it's still there. All right. Now, as far as their manufacturing, they started out right after the war when they realized they could not conquer Southeast Asia. They wouldn't be allowed to, so they, they got to work. Their land is not all that great for farming. So they began manufacturing. The first things they made were really, really cheap cameras. And I saw a picture one time of the original Minolta Maxim camera, and it consists of a little plastic background with a uh, folding accordion type lens to adjust the lens. I mean, very, very cheaply put together. But eventually Minolta began to make some really, really high quality good cameras. But it started out cheap. The manufacturing also started out with cheap toys. And when I was a kid, the word made in Japan meant just a very, very inexpensive, in fact, a worthless toy. But my dad taught me a lesson about Japanese technology more than 50 years ago that I never forgot. My dad had two cars that had friction motors. Any of you ever played with these when you were a kid? A friction motor car is where you rev it up a bit and then turn it loose and then roll across the room. My dad said, now this one was made in the United States and this one was made in Japan. Now these Japanese are some way smarter than we are. So he revved them both up and turned them both loose on a hardwood floor. The American car went a few feet and stopped. It didn't want to go. The Japanese made car went fast, hit the wall, flipped over, and bounced back up on its top. And I would guess, yeah, these people must be pretty smart because uh, they, it might not have been a fair comparison. With all due respect, the American car was big and bulky and heavy. The Japanese little car was very light and um, but nevertheless, there was a comparison there. Eventually, the Japanese went from making children's toys to transistor radios. But back up in 1955, Secretary of State Dulles says, Japan makes nothing the United States wants. That may have been true then. But in the 1960s, they started making transistor radios. Then they started making tape recorders. Then they started making televisions. Now, have any of you ever heard of Companies like Sylvania, Western House, Westinghouse, RCA. Where are they now? You may be able to find RCA. Somewhere. You may name RCA's too, but Sylvania Admiral 
Those were American companies that used to make televisions, and they're all gone, out of business. Some of them have been absorbed by other companies. Eventually, the Japanese were able to completely obliterate the American market in things like VCRs, camcorders, and TVs. Yeah. Yeah, there, there are no, not one flat screen TV like we know TVs now. Well, I mean, we quit making, uh, of course, the VCR is obsolete. We quit making a DVD. What's that? They're not, not as far. I think, I think she's right that we that um, all these things are made abroad where they have cheaper labor. And um, now, for a while, they started making cars. At first, their cars were looked on as being cheap, made in Japan cars. But then their cars got better and better until they threatened the American automobile, especially since it was proven in court that American manufacturers were making cars that only last about five or six years the most, then fall apart. Well, people stopped buying American cars and started buying Japanese in droves. And American manufacturers began to realize, hey, we're going to have to change if we survive. Now today, you buy a car in the USA, and it's probably just as good as the one made in Japan. But that's today. 30 years ago, the Japanese cars might very well have been better. Now, and sometimes that's a matter of opinion. But to, based on customer complaints, Japanese cars have just as many, if not more, now than American made cars. But for a while, Japan threatened to put American automobiles out of business. Um, they began to make musical instruments. Yes, Yamaha doesn't just make motorcycles. Yamaha makes trumpets. Uh, Honda, I believe Honda makes pianos also. Or Yamaha, I know, does. Yamaha makes them. Um, they make extremely good musical instruments, extremely high quality cameras, camcorders. Um, very, very, they take a lot of pride in their work very high level of workmanship. 